Please welcome Kurt Sievers, President and Chief Executive Officer, NXP Semiconductors, and Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker. Thank you. Hello again, everybody. Kurt, welcome. Thank you, Eric. Great to have you here. Great to see you. You know, um, we give our panelists and subjects strict instructions, and I told Kurt that he shouldn't bother coming to Ireland unless he had succeeded in having the European Chips Act passed first, and lo and behold, it passed last night. Well done, Kurt. <laughs> so, I, uh, thanks, Eric, and, and by the way, thanks for having me here. I'm, I'm very impressed with the event so far. Uh, now, I didn't do this for yesterday, uh, still for the industry. I, I trust for Europe it is great that it passed yesterday. And in my view, it's actually pretty fast for European standards because I remember in February last year, Thierry Breton uh, went out and announced the intent of the CHIPS Act, given the uh, priority for supply chains and for the geopolitical, say, resilience against geopolitical turmoil. Uh, and doing this in just a little more than a year is really cool. 14 months approximately. Yes, yes. Well, your industry, semiconductors, is the poster child for globalization. Um, of course, it has now become a geopolitical battleground. Yeah. And I want to talk to you about that because on the one hand, the West is trying to starve China of advanced chip technology and meantime, you have Europe with the CHIPS Act, the European CHIPS Act, and the United States with its own CHIPS Act competing with each other for chip making capacity by offering tens of billions of dollars each in subsidies for fab construction. Is this a turning point? That's a big question. Uh, let me try and parse it, Eric. So first of all, um, there is no digital without chips. And I emphasize that because everybody speaks about the digitalization of the world. And I would even go a step further. There is no green deal without chips. So yes, it's, it's a bit like the new oil for the, uh, for the world. And given some of these geopolitical tensions, especially between the US and China, um, it's become a necessity, I believe, to be more resilient against these geopolitical tensions. Uh, and while finding it out the hard way through the past two years during the pandemic, and what I mean with the hard way is that we've all seen how key industries in Europe and the US, especially in the industrial, medical, and automotive sectors, have suffered from a shortage of, of semiconductors, it became painfully aware how much we all depend on semiconductors. Um, I mean, I've been in this industry for 30 years now, and 27 years of that period, I could never talk with my friends about what I'm doing because nobody knew what <laughs> chips are. Now everybody does, and again, in a, from a painful way. Now, coming back to the Chips Act, I think um, it is late, uh, but it is good, very good and very needed uh, to, to do this. Uh, but there is a few attention points, and you mentioned one of them. The one you mentioned is, I think it would be fantastic if there was a lot of synchronization between the US CHIPS Act and the European CHIPS Act in terms of what to support, such that it will be complementary. I see this as one Western world, which should be combining the funds almost in order to create the best together. I mean, the US has 50 plus billion. We just signed yesterday the 43 billion euros in, in Europe. Mind you that in the end, it is big money from a government perspective, it is little money from an industry perspective, uh, which means we have to spend it in a very dedicated and very uh, well thought through way in order to get the best out of it. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, so I think you were overly critical in your question. Um, I would say we have to make sure and pay attention that it does happen more and more um, going forward. There is though an underlying tension to some of these subsidy programs. Perhaps it is not as strong in the case of the CHIPS Act as it is in the case of, say, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Net Zero Industry Act that Europe now wants to pass in, in response. But there is some tension, is there not? I mean, how do you get over 
that lack of coordination? I, I would actually say for the, for the IRA, from what I'm seeing, there is a lot of tension. I mean, absolutely, yes. In the CHIP sector, this is less. Mm -hmm. uh, it was earlier, uh, and it, it came from a different direction. I mean, it, it, it feels now it falls all in a similar pot, but it actually started in a different way. So th there, is some, there is some synchronization, but we, again, we have to make sure there is more um, um, going forward. It's just important to understand that the, the CHIPS Act in the US and in Europe should not be seen as a remedy to the supply chain crisis of the last two years. Because that supply chain crisis in semiconductors for the automotive and industrial sectors was not a consequence of the pandemic. It was also not a consequence of geopolitical sanctions. Not at all. It was simply a structural underfunding into, into, into semiconductor capacity in those, in those areas. So, I mean, let's not use it as a quick remedy to that. I think it should be seen as a long-term um, way to achieve more tax sovereignty in what really drives the world going forward. And I, I do believe, for what it's worth, that many legislators in the United States, many legislators in Europe who just yesterday passed the European CHIPS Act, believe that it is for strategic purposes. NXP is a Dutch company, but you're a global manufacturer. How are you affected by the export restrictions to China? Um, I remember well the days when the export control uh, was targeted against Huawei a couple of years ago, and it did hit us overnight because we indeed shipped uh, radio power transistors into, into RF base stations for for um, also to Ericsson, Nokia, and other mm -hmm. customers, but also to Huawei. So we immediately complied, like everybody did. Uh, so it did hit us. And I'm, I'm very supportive to the direction of doing these things. What I think for our industry is sometimes hard to deal with is there doesn't seem to be a clear roadmap on what to expect going forward. So we need a bit more certainty and a bit more clarity in how these um, this tightening of the export control rules might be marching forward. Uh, but yes, it, it does hit us. Um, you said in the beginning in your first question, Eric, semiconductors is a poster child for globalization. I would absolutely support that statement. Our industry has grown over the past 50 plus years in a world where we could manufacture, where it was optimal to manufacture, where we could uh, develop IP and do R&D, where it was best to do it. And with the exception of a few sanctions, we could ship wherever we wanted to ship to. Now, why is that important for our industry? Because we need scale. The, from my vantage point, the enormous benefit for relatively cheap semiconductors we are all enjoying, and don't forget, your smart home, your washing machines, your, all of the white goods, your cars, your mobile wallet, everything works on chips. I mean, if there were no chips, this whole room wouldn't, nothing would work here, right? Um, but getting this into affordable price points has been a result of scale, global scale in our industry, which is why our industry is struggling with where we, where we currently are. I mean, we can change it. We, we need to see how we are adjusting to this new world. But the decoupling, I think, has significant impact on how the semiconductor industry will have to operate going forward. Things will just, it's a simple fact of things being more expensive as a result? I, or it taking much longer for product to get to market? And I, I see both sides. Eventually, again, we, we, I think as an industry, we try our best to not let the worst happen. But the two, um, uh, I think, directions we, we are seeing is the resilience of supply chains. If that translates into local manufacturing, and that's what parts of the chip sect is all about, with Europe and US building more chip factories, uh, that comes at a higher cost point. You mentioned a couple of minutes ago that you're supportive, in principle, of the export restrictions, and you comply. Historically, more than half of NXP's revenue comes from China. How, as a semiconductor CEO, do you reconcile what I would describe as two competing realities? One, having loyal customers in China and wanting to serve them. And two, recognizing that increasingly the West and China are rivals and selling technology to China may be putting the West at a strategic disadvantage. How do you reconcile that? Well, I, I would put it that way. Um, just 
to get the numbers straight first, we, we ship about 38% of our revenue today into China, which is a large part, almost 40%. Lower now, than it used to be, though. Yes. And the matter of the fact is that only half of that stays in China. Mm. So only half of that 38% is actually China for China. The rest is all the good products which are semi-manufactured in China, but then being exported again to the West. Now, a lot of that going forward could eventually move out of China, which doesn't harm us. So we would just follow where our customers are moving their production to. Um, there is one famous example. We, I think we've all seen that Foxconn, for example, has announced that they move some of their manufacturing from China into India, which is possibly, and I, I saw it in the earlier uh, meeting here, uh, could be one of the beneficiaries. So that part of the business, Eric, uh, we are not worried about because we would just follow wherever the manufacturing is moving. Um, now, China still in itself is, of course, also a significant market, and we have to see how we best arrange for that going forward. Do you trust your fellow semiconductor CEOs to comply as strictly as you do? Yes, absolutely. Totally. No, I, I'm, I'm very sure that all of the semiconductor companies, and many of them, by the way, are U.S. headquartered, mm -hmm. so they have a strong association uh, with the U.S., are 100% compliant with the export control. So this export control regime does work, will work, should work. It's not going to be like, you know, sanctions on Russia and stuff is getting into Russia via China or Turkey or Kazakhstan or wherever. No, we, we absolutely uh, uh, comply with these rules. Um, that there will always be dark channels where people do stuff which is beyond the semiconductor company's control, we can never exclude. But I think the compliance rate is 100% of the industry, including us. Kurt, the, the world's most important and advanced chip maker, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC, is a valuable partner of yours. It makes many of NXP's chips. How anxious are you about the future of Taiwan given President Xi's very public ambitions to reunify China? Uh, I will confirm that TSMC is an enormously important factor in the global semiconductor industry. Um, it is a so-called foundry. Um, so we are more and more focusing on the chip design and have the foundries manufacture our, our products. Uh, and clearly, the um, strong drive which we are witnessing and discussing with TSMC to globally expand out of Taiwan. We've seen enormous investments the other day in, uh, in Arizona, in the US. Um, they have uh, publicly stated they are building a factory in Japan. So this is happening as we speak. I think we appreciate that a lot because that is one mitigation versus what you were uh, mentioning. Mm -hmm. I am not in a position to judge uh, how big that risk is between China and Taiwan, but clearly as a global industry, and I, I can only emphasize that goes far beyond semiconductors because semiconductors are just the, the starting point for so many products which are so critical to all of our infrastructures. Um, mitigating that by having a more global footprint in manufacturing is definitely the right way to go. One of the challenges I have to imagine you and other chip designers face is that when it comes to, and this is an NXP specialty, but it certainly is an issue for other chip manufacturers, there really is no other game in town you know, for narrow line widths than TSMC is there. They are leading, let me put it that way, which, which makes it even more important to, um, to try and globally uh, de-risk it by having more, more manufacturing locations. Um, at, at the same time, Eric, I, I actually believe that um, the pressure of that need for de-risked supply will find its way. I mean, there, there will be different, different means coming up to mitigate that. And coming back to your initial question, the US Chips Act and the European Chips Act has a large part of the funding dedicated to manufacturing, which is exactly dealing with that particular issue. So the semiconductor manufacturing companies like yours want more manufacturing diversification. The lawmakers in the United States and Europe get that, and they're providing capital yes. to facilitate the addition of capacity. But one of the major criticisms of both these acts is there simply isn't enough specialty manufacturing and engineering talent in either the United States or anywhere in Europe 
for this to become a reality in the next few years. Is that fair? That's a big deal, Eric. I, I think that is actually structurally something we really have to pay attention to. Uh, the semiconductor industry is, is, is forecasted to grow to a trillion dollars by 2030, which is in our, in our way to look at it just a few years away. That, that's not long. I mean, we do now designs for 25, 26. One generation later is 2030. A trillion dollar industry, which is at the bottom of all of the critical infrastructures in the world, needs more talent. And we don't have enough talent. There, there has been a period over the past five to 10 years that everybody thought about software, which by the way is equally important. I mean, chips and software are like twins. The one needs the other. There is, it's just intertwined. Uh, but we clearly see that worldwide, we need more um, skilled engineers coming out of universities to deal with that need. When I said earlier, part of the reason for the supply chain crisis was underinvestment, structural underinvestment into capacity, part of that is also a, a lack of skilled labor. Um, so very clearly, and we have that discussion in, in Europe and the US, part of the programs of the CHIPS Act beyond manufacturing has to be R&D and then making sure that skilled labor is becoming available going forward. With that in mind, is Europe's goal of doubling its share of global, produ global chip production, I should say, to 20% by 2030 realistic? Let me say that way. I'm a big believer in bold targets, Eric. If you don't have a big target, you will not play big. Be ambitious in other that's, words. That's very simple. Realistically speaking, uh, I think we come from less than 10% world manufacturing share in Europe in semiconductors going to 20% in a fast-growing industry. I mean, the point is this is not static. Every, everything is growing. Uh, is a tall task. But again, I think if we don't have tall tasks, we will never get there. I, I think I said this somewhere before. The, we calculated, and, and this is not exactly precise, but we calculated, we think it, it takes about 500 billion investment in Europe to come to that 20%. The CHIPS Act, which was signed off yesterday, is 43 billion. Mm. That gives you a feel for the magnitude of the target. But again, I'm not saying that to criticize it. On the contrary, I'm just saying this is big, this is important, we cannot think and work on it enough. Kurt, one of the immutable laws of the semiconductor industry is the cycle. Chip demand is cyclical. So boom is always followed by bust, and with it, of course, supply destruction. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, given what you were saying about the fundamental role semiconductors play in a digital economy, with the never-ending explosion of data, the growth of data-enabled products, such as self-driving cars, the emergence, as we've heard already, and we'll hear much more today, of artificial intelligence, that it, in at least some parts of the industry, the cycle will be broken? That is what I personally think, yes. And those parts are the ones which happen to be super relevant for Europe. It's about energy conversion, electric cars, industrial automation, which is exactly where Europe is very strong. And where NXP is a Where NXP major is leading. Um, and the reason for that is that the technologies needed there are not the leading edge technologies, but typically are mixed signal and higher voltage technologies. It has to do with electric cars running on 400 volt or 800 volt. You need different, different semiconductor technologies there. And that capacity is not available. We are still busy building it. And the boom and bust is always a consequence of overcapacity. So in my view, we are years away from overcapacity for that growing demand, which is a wonderful place to be for NXP, I would actually say, from a larger perspective, it is also a great place to be for Europe because it, economically, that's a fantastic opportunity for all so of us. So what, what we see happening today to Intel, for example, to Samsung and to Micron is not going to happen to NXP and it's not going to happen to the semiconductor supply, to the automotive industry, or say, to the industrial industry. That's what in we believe. The, the down cycle you currently see is in consumer-oriented products which are actually those products which have been benefiting from the pandemic. With people working from home, they needed more laptops, more screens, more Bluetooth headsets, etc. And it is those products which are now coming down into the typical down cycle. 
The, the products which are needed in so much demand for automotive, for industrial automation, for a smart home, as I said earlier, had nothing to do with the pandemic. That demand is much more structural and, and, and secular in, in, in nature. And no, the companies which are largely exposed to those sectors will not see a down cycle the next few years. Kurt, thank you so very much. Eric. Kurt Sievers, the CEO of NXP. Thank you.